Hi everybody, uh, welcome back for the second edition of the High Yield Rapid Pharmacology Review. Uh, this is Mike Fiore, you'll be hearing Mina a little bit later. So, as always, I will always begin every single lecture with a little disclaimer that we are, you know, we are playing Vegas right now and you have to take everything we say with not a grain of salt but a whole mound of salt. We're giving you what we feel is the high yield review of the uh, topics. We're not going to cover everything. We're not going to go over over every single detail. So, you know, we do definitely want to study a little bit and, and use the other notes and try to get as much of the information down pat as you can. But we're sort of here to give you a little bit of, uh, you know, what we think are the high yield most important points. So the first thing we're going to talk about today are the antihistamines. So just a little bit of physio review, sort of to nail home what we're going to be talking about later, uh, histamine physiology. So where is histamine found? Now, histamine is obviously found in more areas in the body that I have listed here, but for what we're going to be talking about and what antihistamines are used for, it's extremely important that you know these three things. So mast cells, we all know that mast cells are those finicky cells that when pollen starts falling from the trees, we all start having runny noses and itchy eyes because mast cells released histamine and are mediated by the uh, histamine 1 receptor and are the major confounder or the major, I guess, agent in allergic rhinitis and allergic reactions. Uh, number two, enterochromaffin-like cells, ECL cells, which are located in the stomach. Those are H2 receptors, histamine 2 receptors, and they are one of the I guess one of the components of uh, acid secretion. We won't be talking much about that today because those are H2 blockers, but uh, eventually, as the year goes on, we'll be talking about that. So laying the foundation now. Finally, we have neurons. So histamine is actually a neurotransmitter, which is found in neurons, and that is mediated with the uh, histamine 1 receptor again. And remember that histamine mediates arousal. That'll come into play when we talk a little bit more about what some of the uh, histamine agents are used for. So as we talked about, as I alluded to before, mast cells, the cells that are sensitized by IgE antibodies that attach to their surface when they're exposed to antigens like pollen, they cause decranulation and make us feel like crap. Uh, also, very high yield, uh, especially for the boards, um, non-IgE mediated allergies. So drugs like a lot of... Uh, the time they'll talk about morphine and there's another antibiotic that you'll learn about vancomycin that can cause histamine release from uh, their storage sites but that's not uh, uh, it's not an immunologic reaction it's not an actual allergic reaction so you'll see when you go into your third year there's a lot of patients who are actually um, have uh, you know allergies to morphine and vancomycin and different drugs when in reality it's actually a non-IgE mediated reaction that will occur every time you give that drug if you give you know at a high enough rate you will actually just cause uh, the histamine to be released so our first round is our H1 receptor antagonists and it's very important to remember that these are the first generation I'll explain why shortly so we have a couple of them here chloramphyramine, diphenhydramine which is Benadryl, promethazine which is Phenergan, meclizine which is bonine and hydrazine hydroxyzine sorry so it's very important to uh, know the names of the drugs as Mina has said before in the previous lecture honestly it's probably the hardest thing to do is just keep straight you know the five drugs that are uh, histamine receptor antagonists and so in quotations sorry in parentheses I've just included some of the brand names because they you know, may help you associate uh, with what they do better because, you know, everybody's heard of Benadryl, but maybe not everybody has heard of diphenhydramine. So, as we said, they're uh, histamine 1 receptor antagonists, and these are used for a whole slew of things that I bet you didn't even realize. So, obviously, you know, if you have allergies or you have an allergic reaction, you can take some Benadryl. You can take your H1 receptor antagonist. Also, for upper respiratory infections, but in addition, they're used for motion sickness, they're antiemetics, and they're also sleep aids. So, you know, it actually is really useful if you just want to have a couple, uh, a, little, a little bottle of Benadryl in your house at all times, because it can really be used for a whole slew of things. Uh, and some of the side effects. So our first generation antihistamines, uh, 
are actually extremely sedating, and that's sort of the big um, the big reason why there was a push to have the second generation created. Because if you're looking for an allergy pill, you know, if you take a Benadryl, you're going to fall asleep. It's going to make you really tired. That's why sort of you see the TV commercials for the second generation non-drowsy allergy pills. The other thing I want to talk about is how they're very anticholinergic, and I'm going to talk about what that means on the next slide. In addition, because they're sedating, you have to worry about giving them with other sedating drugs because that can actually have a synergistic effect and cause more sedating. So if you take a, a drug like a benzodiazepine, like Valium or Xanax, with a Benadryl or a diphenhydramine, you can have uh, more sedation. Same thing goes for if you drink some alcohol with Benadryl. It's going to you know, really sedate you pretty heavily. Finally, it's kind of a little fun fact, but also can uh, find itself to uh, boards, is there is a paradoxical effect of antihistamines in children. So as I said before, histamines, uh, they're a neurotransmitter that actually work in uh, arousal. So when you give an antihistamine and you block the histamine neurotransmitter, you cause sedation. For whatever reason, in kids, it actually causes excitation. Kids get more excited. So if you ever have a patient who's got a three-year-old kid who's going to go on a flight and the parent wants to, you know, drug their kid before they go fly on a plane and you tell them that you can take some Benadryl and it may help, also let them know that the kid may, or may, you know, the kid may fall asleep or he may start running up and down the aisles of the plane. So, got to be careful. So, as I said, uh, the anticholinergic side effects. So this is, it's sort of a very important concept to just kind of nail down because people are going to use that term a lot and it actually can, if you know that a drug is anticholinergic, you can pretty much guess what some of the side effects are without having to really think about it. So to explain like what anticholinergic means, I sort of have just a little process going on over here. So we all know that there's the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. We know that our sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight response and our parasympathetic is our rest and digest. Those things are mediated by epinephrine and norepinephrine on our fight and flight system and uh, acetylcholine in our rest and digest. So from there, we get the terms adrenergic and cholinergic. Adrenergic being from you know our epinephrine and norepinephrine and cholinergic from acetylcholine. So if you give a drug, like antihistamine, uh, an antihistamine drug like Benadryl, it's very anticholinergic. So it's blocking cholinergic nerve transmission. You're sort of reducing your parasympathetic nervous system. So in essence, if you do that, you're reducing the parasympathetic nervous system. You're actually also increasing your sympathetic output. You're not directly increasing your sympathetic output, but by blocking the parasympathetic system, you will get more effect from your sympathetic system. And it's very important to understand that because if you look at anticholinergic side effects, blurried vision or medriasis, which is pupil dilation, constipation, decreased sweating, dizziness, dry mouth, these are all sort of the fight or flight responses that we get when you know we're ready to give a speech and we have a sympathetic system just overflowing. So just by knowing that, you know, understanding that cholinergic is parasympathetic and adrenergic is sympathetic and then putting anti or in front of either one, you can sort of figure out what some of the side effects are going to be. So just memorize anticholinergic side effects pretty much just our sympathetic system. And what are our sympathetic flight or flight responses? We have dilated pupils. We... You know, we stop moving our gastrointestinal system because, you know, we don't know what we're going to have to be doing in the next 10 minutes. And we stop sweating. We get a little dizzy. Our mouth gets dry. So remember that and it'll help you out for, you know, the rest of your career. All right. So enough of that other stuff, anticholinergic stuff. And now we come to the second generation of the histamines. Now, these are uh, things I'm sure you still see commercials for today. Stuff like loratadine, which is claritin. Cetirazine, which is Zyrtec, and Fexofenadine, which is Allegra. And then we have a nasal spray, uh, Azelastine. Uh, in addition, there are also two isomers. So they um, took loratadine, and I think it's the uh, desloratadine, I think it's like the R isomer, and the levocetirazine is the L isomer of Claritin and Zyrtec, respectively. I believe the point of that is, you know, there might have been some 
side effect or better potency profile. So they try to give an isomer and, you know, maybe it sat well with patients better and there were less side effects. Regardless, that's not, you know, it's not really something you have to know for this exam. So mechanism of action, they are antihistamines. They block the H1 receptor. So they are only used for the most part for allergic rhinitis. So just those, you know, runny noses in the summertime, in the springtime when the pollen comes. Uh, our big advantage with our second generation agents is they're much less sedating than our first generation. And this is because they actually, they don't cross the blood brain barrier and they can't block the uh, H1 receptor in our, uh, in our brain. In addition, they're also uh, less anticholinergic. So there are less of those side effects we had talked about before, less uh, constipation, less dizziness, less dry mouth. So they're a little bit more tolerable. And uh, I didn't put it on the slide here because I didn't want to add it anywhere, but uh, just for your knowledge, if you are in the market for a uh, allergy pill, Zyrtec or Cetirizine is actually the strongest out of the three. Zyrtec, Claritin, and Allegra. Claritin is actually not as strong as Zyrtec. Now we all react differently to different drugs, but being the pharmacist, and I'm trying to do some patient counseling. If you're in the market for a allergy pill, Zyrtec is actually the strongest one. Finally, I just have some uh, other little tidbits here. So there were sort of things that were included in your uh, lecture that you know we don't really feel is going to be too important, but just to sort of show you the high yield facts that like, you know, if you have to know one thing about this drug, here's what it is. So chromalin sodium. So this is a histamine release inhibitor. It, it like you want to sort of burn it into your memory that chromalin is a mast cell stabilizer. You'll see I, there are multiple questions on UWorld. That's how it's described. This one inhibits degranulization by stabilizing the mast cell. And it's only used in prophylaxis of allergic rhinitis and bronchial asthma. So if you have an asthma attack that's going on, chromalin no longer works. Finally, the you know one of the most important points is this one is 100% safe in pregnancy. So if you ever you know family medicine, peds, ob gyne, whatever it is, if you have somebody who comes in and they're allergic to having a allergic rhinitis, and they want to use something, you can tell them that you know chromalin is 100% safe. Everything else, you know we. You know, we, we can't be 100% sure, but for whatever reason, this one is known to be 100% uh, safe. Uh, Nidochromil, pretty low yield. It's an ophthalmic agent. It seems to work the same as chromalin. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Or olopatidine, another ophthalmic agent. Uh, this one's a beta-2 agonist, which we'll learn about uh, for the next exam, but it also appears to reduce histamine release. I wouldn't really focus too much on those two agents. Finally, uh, Montelukast or Singular. We, uh, Mina had spoken about this last exam. This one blocks the leukotriene receptor and it blocks uh, bronchioconstriction. Not too sure why it's included in this lecture, but just for completeness sake, you know, we have how it works and its uses there. And of course, it's the one of the best drugs because it has no side effects. <laughs>